Good afternoon and welcome to our media briefing. Over the past few months, uh, we've uh, talked a lot about the impact of coronavirus, especially uh, on those who are older and those with underlying health conditions, and therefore they're more vulnerable. But as this virus has hung on and affected more and more people, we're starting to see it have an impact on young adults too. If you've been following the charts over the last uh, few days and weeks, you'll notice that we continue to see a rise in the number of cases among young people, especially those in the 20 to 29 year age group who are, are accounting for a larger and larger share of the COVID-19 cases. We know that when you're in your 20s, you think of yourself as being invincible. But while younger adults may think they are less likely to be affected, the fact is that some have developed life-threatening conditions and symptoms that will have long-lasting effects. We don't want young people to carry the physical and emotional scars of this illness for the rest of their lives. And we don't want them to spread the disease to others, like older, vulnerable residents and relatives. That's why today we are joined by Dr. Scott Eisman, who is a, a pulmonologist from Scripps Hospital, who has seen firsthand the impacts of COVID-19. Dr. Eisman is here today to detail the health impacts this virus has had, especially on young adults. I also want to let you know that Supervisor Fletcher will not be joining us today as he has a family commitment. But Dr. Wooten is here to provide the medical update and go over the charts. So with that, let me call up Dr. Wooten. Thank you, Chairman Cox, and good afternoon, everyone. Global, national, and statewide statistics are based on the data that we retrieve every day from the Johns Hopkins dashboard, uh, which is obtained uh, uh, by noon each day. And you can see that information on this overall graph. Today, the statistics for the county of San Diego are from reports as of 11.59 p.m. yesterday. The total uh, number of cases is now at 21,446, which is 559 more cases than reported yesterday, and includes 448 deaths, which is 12 more deaths reported since yesterday. In the next slide, uh, this uh, provides uh, overall statistics uh, and demographics for all of our cases. Um, as a reminder, the age range of our cases is from three months of age to 102 years of age. 58% of the cases are in the age uh, range uh, from 20 to 49 years of age. So that's 11, uh, rather 12,474 uh, uh, individuals or cases. Again, 58%, which is slowly increased uh, from about 50% since the beginning of the pandemic. 51% of the uh, total number of cases are female, 49% are male. Uh, 2,093 or 10% of uh, all cases have been hospitalized. Uh, of that number, 546 uh, have been admitted uh, to the ICU. This number is 3% of the total number of cases and 20% of the total number of those hospitalized. Uh, again, uh, there are uh, 448 total deaths, which represent slightly over 2% of the total number of cases. 109, if you can go to the next slide, 197 or 42% of those that uh, died were female, uh, 56 or 251 are male, and 425 or 95% of the total uh, deaths had underlying medical conditions. 22 or 5 percent of the total deaths had no underlying medical conditions. And as always, our sincerest um, condolences and sympathies go out to those individuals that have lost their lives due to COVID-19. 
Now in the uh, next set of slides, uh, we're going to talk, uh, share with you additional uh, demographics related to testing, uh, cases, and hospitalizations. In this particular slide, uh, this uh, shows the result of our T3 strategy, test, trace, and treat. Uh, we are well over our goal uh, for stage two, which is uh, 5,200 uh, tests, uh, which is equivalent to uh, one test per 1,000 population. Uh, and we have gone even over the stage three goal of two tests per 1,000 population. So we are, uh, for July 14th, we had 8,436 uh, tests completed or a seven day average of 8,056 tests. For trace, uh, we have 511, or rather 13 uh, staff that are involved in case investigation as well as contact tracing. So uh, of this 513 total, 215 are case investigators and 242 are contact tracers and an additional 56 are admin staff. And I'll talk more about the uh, case investigators uh, shortly when we talk about triggers. Uh, as it relates to treating, we have uh, 73 individuals in isolation in our public uh, health hotels. In this next slide, uh, this uh, complements the information that I just showed with you. Uh, this is the rolling 14-day uh, average, which is the line at 6.3%. Uh, and for the total number of tests performed yesterday, 7% uh, of that total uh, uh, was positive. Next slide. So this just supports uh, the testing information that shows uh, over the past almost uh, um, uh, several weeks the daily number of tests. So that supports the, uh, the T3 strategy. And as you can see on the left side, we started slowly, uh, continuously uh, increased, and now again we are well above the um, stage three target of two tests per 1,000 population, which is 6,600 tests. In the next slide, this is our epidemiology curve, uh, which shows um, the beginning of our first cases. And uh, in the beginning of uh, April, we basically had a plateau. We like to uh, speak of that as flattening the curve. Um, if we show the next slide, then uh, as we began to open up uh, more uh, businesses, uh, we are looking at the period after that where we, uh, we began to see increased cases. And we recognize that we would have incre increased uh, number of cases here. Uh, the um, incline of the number of cases uh, is, however, dramatically uh, uh, higher than uh, previous weeks. So we wanted to show uh, how this has uh, played out. In the next slide, this is a, a number of new cases. On the left is by week. Uh, and again, we can see that after uh, mid-June, we began to see an increase in the number of cases. And on the right side is, ju uh, is just uh, the daily numbers uh, that we will continue to follow. But uh, in the past uh, 10 days to two weeks, we have been consistently, with the exception of a couple of days, uh, uh, either between 500, uh, rather 400 and 550 plus cases daily. In this next slide, uh, we wanted to uh, really show how the, uh, since May 25th, this is COVID-19 cases by age group and week of illness onset, which is more uh, accurate in wh how we report our epi curve date of onset of illness. And uh, since May 25th, we have had 13,868 uh, cases and here we wanted to show with the exception of the uh, shaded out area on the right because we know more cases will occur there as that is the incubation period how uh, our total number of cases in this time period have increased by age group so we see that uh, 20 to 39 years of age is the highest age group where we have seen an increase in the number of uh, cases followed second by uh, 
uh, the 40 uh, to 59 um, uh, age group, which is the green. In the next slide, this is uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations among San Diego County residents. These are new hospitalizations by date reported. And uh, also uh, since mid-June, uh, we can see an increase in the number of hospitalizations. Going uh, to the next slide, this is, uh, if we look at any point in time, any day, uh, since the beginning of the outbreak for hospitalization, this is all hospitalizations associated with uh, confirmed uh, COVID uh, um, patients. Uh, we can see that again, since the um, mid of June, the numbers of hospitalizations have increased. And we shared that uh, the increase is seen mostly in the uh, 20 to 29 and the 30 to 39 as well as the 40 to 49 age group. Next slide. And this again is another uh, rendition of hospitalizations by age group and week of hospital admission, again since May 25th. And particularly uh, since mid-June, again, the increase has been seen across uh, all of those three age groups that I just shared with you, 20 to 29, um, um, 30 to uh, 39, and 40 to um, uh, 49 age group. Here they are uh, uh, grouped a little differently than the way we report them on the table that was uh, shown uh, at the beginning, but still the age range particularly from uh, 20 to 39 uh, and uh, 30 to 39 and from um, uh, 40 to uh, 59 are the highest age groups with the aside of uh, 60 plus which is the highest, but we see the increase in the younger age groups below that. Next slide. So now I would like to move into our triggers. So this slide has the consistent uh, three triggers that have been abnormal for the past uh, uh, week to 10 days. And trigger number one is associated with case rate. This is the trigger that gets us on the state's monitoring list. and. Uh, if we will go to the next slide, uh, it shows how we have progressed um, and, um, from July 9th up uh, to uh, the 15th. So again, this is what the state monitors, this is available, uh, can be found on their way website where uh, they compare all counties to each other. Next slide shows uh, information about outbreaks. So this is trigger number two. And the target is uh, seven or more uh, outbreaks in the past seven days. And as you can see, um, in the past uh, three weeks, uh, we have continuously seen an, uh, an increased number of outbreaks. And today, our target, um, the next slide, is uh, we have 14 outbreaks in community settings. Uh, and in the past seven days, we have a total of these 14 outbreaks. And this slide and the next slide shows the category uh, and breakout of the various locations. And these are the four newest outbreaks uh, reported uh, and confirmed as of yesterday. We have one in a, a, a laboratory, one in a hair salon, one barbershop, and one in a restaurant slash bar. In the next slide, uh, this shows uh, or is related to trigger number uh, 11, which is related to case investigations. And the target here is uh, no less than 70% of all cases uh, reported are contacted or contact is initiated. And uh, we thought uh, after that uh, number was declining to 57%, we were on the upswing, uh, but started to decline again because the numbers are continuing to increase. Today we issued a, um, a job announcement for uh, staff uh, to come on as case investigators and after only three hours we had over 300 applications received. So we anticipate that uh, bringing on onboarding and training uh, the staff that are hired uh, will uh, improve this particular um, uh, trigger. Next slide. And lastly, 
we want to encourage everyone to practice good hand hygiene and sanitation, to keep uh, their distance six feet apart, wear face coverings and avoid crowded places, and to uh, also stay at home if you're sick. That's a very important um, uh, factor and we want everyone to adhere to that. Adhering to these strategies will help to decrease the spread uh, of COVID-19. So now I would uh, please uh, welcome to the podium, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Eisman, uh, who will talk to us about uh, hospitalization of our younger uh, population uh, with COVID-19. Dr. Scott Eisman has been practicing medicine in San Diego since 1990 and was, uh, is board certified in internal medicine since 1985, uh, board certified in pulmonary medicine in 1988, and uh, board certified in critical care medicine in 1989. So he is a definite uh, expert uh, from Scripps Healthcare to talk about this issue. Dr. Eisman. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for asking me to come and talk today. Uh, as we've heard from Dr. Wooten, the incidence of this problem is increasing uh, dramatically and the ages of people that it affects are now changing as well. <clears throat> We've clearly seen that in our own practices that we have younger and younger patients showing up with more and more significant complications and it's certainly true that uh, the mortality rate for those that are younger is lower than those that are older but it's also true that the mortality rate is not zero and it's also true that this disease is impactful not, just, not only because of the possibility of dying, but that's bad enough as it is, but I think what is really fundamental is to understand the differences in this illness compared to what we think of in, uh, as a flu, for example. I know many younger people think that this is something that you know, you'll get and you'll overcome and everything will be fine. But the complications of this illness are far greater they're much longer lasting and they're far more serious. And so I think it's very important for the public to hear how these things are different. And we know that COVID-19 affects the lungs differently than just the flu. Not only does it affect the little air sacs in your lungs that we call alveoli, but it affects the blood vessels in lungs as well. It causes blood clotting in general, not just in the lungs and that can create very substantial problems with the ability of the lung to deliver oxygen. It's much, much more profound, much more rapid than we typically see in influenza. Uh, and let's remember that at least we have some therapies and an effective vaccine for influenza. We do not have that as much for COVID-19. Um, we know that smoking uh, increases the chances that if you do contract COVID-19 and if you develop pulmonary complications, that those complications may be more severe. There's good evidence that that is also true for vaping, not to mention the fact that we would have a hard time distinguishing what type of lung problem you have because vaping can cause its own lung disease as well. And we've seen a number of cases of that as well. Besides pulmonary disorders, uh, in breathing disorders, I think one of the really important things to understand about this illness is that it's not just limited to the lung. It causes neurologic disorder. Uh, we now know stroke is described in young patients as well as older with COVID-19. Uh, difficulty in thinking, weakness. We know that there are effects on cardiac function in terms of heart failure and irregular heart beating. We know that there are complications with the kidneys, blood system, liver, and those complications may be much longer lasting than people have recognized. We don't really know at this point exactly how this will play out because the disease is too new. Uh, we do know though, I can tell you of a patient that we saw about six weeks ago who was a young man who came to the hospital, 40 years old. His wife and his brother-in-law were both infected as well. They both, they all lived together. 
And uh, he spent 45 days in the hospital, uh, most of which he was on high flow oxygen and laying on his stomach to help uh, improve the delivery of oxygen into his bloodstream. So for a month and a half on his stomach. And I think if you're a 30 or 40 year old individual, you have to think of what that would be like to your life and how long it would take to recover from that. Being weak, not eating well. Um, we know, for example, from the experience in uh, China during the SARS virus, the initial SARS virus in 2003, that studies showed that patients had a significant decrease in their lung function for up to a year after that and longer, particularly those patients who had severe pneumonia. So we think that it is likely this disease will be at least as bad at that, if not worse. The same was true of the MERS um, viral illness, all of which are coronaviruses. This virus seems to be much, much more aggressive than those two viruses. And we know from clinical experience that uh, recovery can be very protracted. People take a long time to return to work, to get their strength back, to uh, even to think properly because it does affect your ability to think and reason and remember. I don't think I can really overstress the importance of trying to prevent the illness. I think if people feel that this is something they can contract and it's not going to be a problem and not going to be a serious thing, then they're not as motivated to do the things to prevent uh, illness, such as distancing and hand hygiene and wearing masks and avoiding crowds, uh, avoiding crowded places such as restaurants that are uh, very tightly packed. I know in Encinitas, uh, two months ago, a month and a half ago, I was driving down 101, and it was very packed. And now we see not but a month or so, five weeks later, a spike in the, uh, in the frequency of the illness. I think if people will take those uh, precautions to heart, hopefully it will avoid having a very serious illness for people. And although I know it's tough to avoid being out among everybody, it's much tougher to contract the illness potentially and potentially fatal. Dr. Wooten, Chairman Cox. Thank you, Dr. Eisman. And, and again, we want to thank all of the doctors, the nurses, all the first responders that have played such a, a key role in, in dealing with this whole pandemic. Uh, they certainly have gone above and beyond the call of duty, and we can never thank them enough for their their service and their commitment and the long, long hours that they are putting in. With that, we're going to go directly to the question. So let's hear the first question. Melissa Messia from 10 News. Please state your question. Hi there. I just had a question um, just regarding nursing homes. I know the state task force has been brought in to help one Paradise Hills nursing homes. Are you aware of how many nursing homes or other facilities locally that has had to have the state task force help? We'll ask uh, Dr. Wooten to, oh, actually, I guess we're going to ask uh, um, the director of our medical operations center, uh, Rob Sills, to respond to that. Thank you, Supervisor Cox. I believe the question was how many uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, the state has come down to assist with, with staffing, and the answer to that, uh, three, we've reached out uh, to the state for staffing assistance, and um, they have come down for three. There are, are uh, all of our skilled nursing facilities are getting assistance with uh, PPE requests uh, from the state, but as far as staffing, I think that was your question, uh, the answer is three. Uh, yeah, it was regarding the state passport. I think they were helping with testing, so it's three nursing homes. Uh, it was um, the the question I heard was staffing, so that was three. As far as the the state uh, task force on testing, um, I none of them have gone into the nursing home. We are giving them uh, testing kits, and the majority of them are doing it themselves, and we're running those uh, for them in conjunction with uh, all the testing that's going on with the county. So I believe that's your question. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Bridget Naso from NBC7, please state your question. 
Thank you. My question is about uh, the number of tests. On Monday, you talked about a shortage of tests, although getting some help from a San Diego-based company, and we know Rite Aid is helping now uh, with some free testing. Uh, but how long do you anticipate that shortage? What are you doing to um, uh, address that shortage and possibly on the cause of the shortage of tests and how that's impacting uh, the ability to determine just how many people, here we are a week after 4th of July, uh, may be coming down with symptoms of COVID? Okay, I think uh, perhaps both Dr. Wooten and uh, Nick Mashion are going to respond to that question. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify our information about testing. On Monday, uh, we shared our strategy and we are partnering with Helix uh, to conduct the uh, specimen collection um, and actually uh, even running the test so that it will leave our public health laboratory uh, available to focus and prioritize outbreaks. So we've developed that uh, partnership and the shortage of supplies is not just a San Diego issue. This is a nationwide issue, uh, and we feel that we have addressed it, um, and we've even reprioritized our priority list, and it is uh, in much alignment with the state's uh, priority list that came out yesterday. And while we might overall uh, be testing uh, less number, we still feel that we are able to continue to test to meet the, the targeted goals that we've identified. Yeah, just to add to Dr. Wooten's uh, uh, statement, uh, we really don't know. Um, and it's upon the manufacturers uh, of these reagents uh, that have to provide it. We do know there's a, a tripling down uh, of these various uh, companies throughout the country, uh, as Dr. Wooten said, uh, to meet the need nationwide, particularly with uh, high prevalence states like ours um, that uh, need uh, more of these reagents. But I, I do want to also mention that it's not just the testing kits. Um, it is the testing machines, and it's also the lab staff. So uh, we are ramping up, uh, you know, our lab staff, and many of our hospital partners and even community clinics are doing uh, three shifts, seven days a week, uh, to try to meet the demand, uh, but also uh, testing equipment. And there's a backlog on testing equipment. So we have to balance all three of these factors, uh, but rest assured that uh, the county lab, our hospital partners, our lab testing task force is working together with our commercial labs and now a new partner with Helix uh, to meet the needs of our county region. Okay, we'll go to the next question. John Carroll from KPBS, please state your question. Yes, thank you, Supervisor, for taking our questions. Um, you are no doubt aware of the situation to our north in Los Angeles County. Um, if it's not dire, it's pretty close. Uh, Mayor Garcetti has now said that he is considering uh, locking down the city and reinforcing uh, stay-at-home orders. Does that give you level of concern, a level of concern for us down here since we're just a short drive away uh, and... What is your reaction to it, and what, if anything, are we doing about that? And I have a follow-up. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Wooten if she'd like to respond to that question. I'm sure we have several people that may want to respond to the question, but uh, hearing that information, we, we are driven by the data, and uh, Los Angeles is three, that's the city of Los Angeles, but the entire county is three times uh, the county of San Diego. So uh, obviously the burden that they experience is far greater than what we have experienced here in San Diego. Uh, we will continue to in, uh, uh, enforce uh, the guidance that have been uh, issued statewide and uh, if we need to do something uh, in terms of closing quote unquote borders from other jurisdictions, that's a, um, a political decision that will be made locally. Dr. McDonald. No, if I could just add one thing to what Dr. Wooten had to say. If you listen to Dr. Eisman earlier uh, talking about the impact uh, that this disease has on those who are uh, increasingly becoming affected in our community. 
uh, I think that answers the question that you're really asking. Uh, here in San Diego, our uh, rate of illness is fortunately lower than actually any other county in Southern California. Uh, Imperial, Orange, Riverside, LA, and San Bernardino all have higher rates than we do and are being uh, affected uh, uh, disproportionately compared to us. We, even within the county, we have areas that are more affected than others. And the message that everyone should take home is exactly the cautions that Dr. Eisman gave about what you can do to prevent uh, the transmission of this disease within the community. So uh, going out only when it's necessary, uh, uh, wearing masks, uh, washing hands and uh, socially distancing. I mean, it's a simple message, but it needs to be repeated over and over, and we need to refocus our own daily commitment to that when we hear these stories about our neighbors and friends uh, uh, north and south of us who are being affected disproportionately by this uh, disease. Thank you, Doctor. And then just a quick question, a reaction, please, to the lawsuit filed by several local gym owners that insist on staying open right now. Well, I don't think we've had a chance really to uh, see those, those uh, legal proceedings at this point. I'm sure we'll get a chance to over the next couple of days and we'll try to prepare a, an appropriate response. Okay, Thank you. next question. Brandon Lewis from News 8, please state your question. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the recent state-imposed closures that went into effect today under the health officer's order. And I'm wondering if the decision to reopen them is still going to be based upon the rate for 100,000 that is trigger number one, or is there still a chance that some businesses could reopen on July 20, uh, 27th? Okay, I'm going to ask Dr. Wooten to respond. Thank you for that question. Uh, the restrictions that have been imposed uh, uh, on San Diego are from the state. And that uh, metric, uh, the trigger number one, is the metric that has uh, placed us on the state's county monitoring list. So until further notice, as has been uh, stated by the uh, governor on Monday's uh, press briefing. Until further notice, there will be no additional openings. And um, because there were additional closures made on Monday, even the three-week uh, assessment uh, period uh, is now, um, it's not three weeks now, it's just basically uh, the assessment will be made and the state will determine uh, when uh, businesses will reopen. So we are we will await any decisions and guidance from the state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question. Matt Hoffman from KPBS, please state your question. Um, hi, I'm following up on an earlier question regarding testing processing. Um, I've talked to some people who've gotten county tests and have had to wait for about a week. Uh, one gentleman is still waiting for results after three weeks. Um, I know Dr. McDonald had said that, frankly, we have an issue with turnaround time. Are you saying today that that's because we don't have enough staff or the right lab equipment to keep up with demand? And how do you guys uh, correct that with, the, as you just mentioned, the shortage in supplies? Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Nick Maschion, the Director of our Health and Human Services Agency and the T3 czar, to uh, respond to that. Matt, thanks for the question. Um, just, to, just to clarify, um, T testing is done in, at many levels uh, in our region. We try to do it uh, seamless for folks to sign up for a test, but we have uh, county testing sites, we have uh, state testing sites, our hospitals doing sites, uh, CVS pharmacies uh, are doing sites, and depending where you go, uh, uh, it's done by different labs. Um, and indeed, uh, it was more recently even shared uh, by Quest um, that they're very backlogged. They're about seven, 10 days out. Uh, in the results. Uh, we know that's not acceptable. They're trying to do better uh, to that. Uh, not too long ago, uh, weeks ago, we had lab equipment went down and we got behind. Uh, presently, for those sites that are coming to the county, uh, the, the, the drop-in site, for example, at Tubman Chavez, uh, from the time that test is taken and goes to our lab, uh, it's about three days 
by which uh, a result is provided and which uh, our EPI team is made aware and quickly uh, gets to those positive cases. We're striving even to be better than three days. Our hospital partners, uh, when you get tested at the hospitals because the urgency of hospitalization, are doing it within 24 hours or less. And even our public health lab, uh, when we get samples from outbreaks, highest priority, uh, or a skilled nursing facility, uh, those are conducted in 24 hours. So we are seeing, indeed, to your point, uh, results that are not coming in uh, timely, and some of this is from our commercial labs. Indeed, it's attributed to uh, lack of reagents and capacity, and what I just talked about earlier about equipment, people, and supplies, um, and everyone is trying to improve that. But again, uh, the urgency by which the turnaround from the public health lab and our hospitals are performing very well. Thank you. Gotcha. And, and so you guys basically believe with this new sort of focus strategy, partnering with Helix, that even though you guys might be doing a little bit less testing, that you're still testing sort of the right people, the right population to still get a scope of where the virus is? Yeah, uh, just one thing, you know, um, we're prioritizing the, the groups because those are the people that need to be tested. And we're seeing more cases as that was shared by Dr. Wooten. So we're going to have more people to be tested that need to be tested. So the, the county testing with Helix now getting up to 2,000 a day is actually going to allow us to possibly do the same and if not more testing. Uh, I was mentioning the outbreaks, uh, those are more tests. So preserving that with Helix absolutely is going to be critical for the county health lab. But again, to put in, uh, in perspective, uh, that, that represents maybe 30, 35 percent of the county lab. Uh, the rest of it, the lion's share of it is our hospital partners that are doing testing and then, of course, the commercial labs. Thank you for that explanation. Okay, let's go to the next question. Bill Center from the San Diego Union Tribune, please state your question. I have several. Uh, the first one is the Del Mar Thoroughbred Club, with assistance from the county, uh, tested jockeys and jockey room personnel on Tuesday, and they came back with 15 positive tests. Uh, first question is, is, is that considered a cluster? And the second part of the first question is, is the county pleased with the steps and protocols being taken by the Del Mar Thoroughbred Club? And also, do they think that they will be able to resume racing on July 24th, as is the plan? Okay. Uh, Dr. McDonald is going to respond. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, indeed, uh, if you're familiar uh, with the history that there were um, a pair of uh, jockeys uh, that were identified uh, uh, the previous weekend uh, who uh, had uh, um, previously been in Orange County along with three other uh, jockeys that uh, were in Orange County but then went to other uh, venues, uh, they were subsequently diagnosed uh, with COVID. Uh, three, more than three individuals uh, from different households in a specific location meets the definition of an outbreak. And uh, so in follow-up to the cases um, uh, that were here in San Diego, uh, we did uh, some close contact investigations and some testing, as was really described uh, previously, what our normal process is. And uh, uh, that testing occurred yesterday, and the results came back today, which resulted in these uh, the identification of um, those individuals, all of whom are asymptomatic, which is good news, uh, but uh, because they've been identified, uh, they all are now uh, in uh, isolation and will be uh, for 10 days. Uh, and uh, as far as the impact of that on future racing, that's a question that's best for the uh, thoroughbred club. Uh, I'm a medical person, not a horse person, even though I grew up in Maryland, as you can tell from this. Uh, but um, uh, we are continuing to look at those individuals and their close contacts that may indeed drive more uh, testing and uh, may uncover some more cases. Uh, so this is an ongoing outbreak that uh, involves ourselves, the Orange County Health Department, the California Department of Public Health, uh, and some other uh, state organizations uh, to get uh, a handle on uh, exactly uh, how many cases there are and uh, to get that uh, under control. And that, does that answer your questions or is there another one? 
I'm sorry. No, that answers my question perfectly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. I might just point out on that last question that uh, because this was a part of a cluster, because it was uh, uh, individuals that were symptomatic, we were able to get those test results back in 24 hours. And so I think that's an indication that the, the time lag that we have witnessed or had to deal with earlier in this uh, pandemic is changing dramatically as we get uh, um, like Helix on board and other uh, testing operations uh, uh, coming into effect. Let's go to the next question. Hunter Soward from KUSI, please state your question. Hi there, I know we've talked and touched on the testing machines and lab staff, but I'm wondering if we can figure out more about the components of the tests that are depleted. Do we know if it's swab, serum, maybe both? And then what's going to happen to the three T's now that we are experiencing this shortage? I'm wondering if this is going to skew our positivity rate with limited testing that um, could potentially be happening. Okay, I think this is gonna be a two-part answer. We have Dr. McDonald and then we have uh, Nick Maschion. Thanks for that question. I think actually uh, Nick gave a great answer to that. Uh, we'd like to talk, talk about the three S's, the staff, uh, structure, and supplies. The structure is the actual machines that are used, uh, and there's a limited number of them, and they can only be run a certain amount of time during the day. There's staff that are required to actually run those machines, and in various uh, laboratories, uh, there are a lot of microbiologists who are working overtime, not just working with the machines, but preparing the samples in order to be put on those machines. And uh, I can tell you that in our, in our public health lab, we've brought on a lot of personnel, as have the hospital labs, and those people are working overtime. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, and those individuals uh, are just like our healthcare workers, uh, tirelessly uh, doing their part to contribute to information about this outbreak. And um, it is stressful for them. And I want to thank each and every one of them. And then the supply issue, there's different supply issues starting from the swabs themselves, depending on which swab you have to use on which machine, to the transport media, to actually the little um, uh, dippers that are used uh, for uh, sample by sample on a machine that then dip in and then draw up the aliquot so that the machine can analyze it. It turns out that that is a specific uh, piece of the machine that, that is in uh, short supply for some machines. And so you have to have every single component lined up. Uh, and most of the time this is seamless. It's only when you're in a situation like this where you have literally millions of tests being done across the country and tens of thousands of tests per week here in San Diego that those small, uh, seemingly insignificant um, uh, components become critical and they are specialized. And so it's, it, the answer is all of the above. And then if somebody could um, yep. speak to the three T. Yeah, um, I'm the three T. Uh, thank you, Dr. McDonald. And, uh, you're gonna get a, a, a three for Dr. Wooten will talk about the positivity uh, rate that you asked also. So for the three T's, right, this is the, the test, trace, uh, and treat. Um, we're not wavering at all from uh, our testing. I think we're emphasizing again, uh, ever since we stood up the T3 strategy, it was testing for the right people, the high priority. Uh, that is not wavering, we're continuing. And the importance of that is the purpose of the test is to find people uh, who indeed uh, are positive so that we can immediately do uh, our epi uh, investigation and tracing and do it uh, with speed and accuracy so we can have people uh, uh, to self-isolate and again to disrupt uh, the spread uh, of the virus. The, the treat part uh, is there. Uh, the county is standing proud of helping anyone who needs a place to self-isolate. Um, uh, I think you saw the last statistic that was provided, T3 chart, uh, we uh, varies day to day, uh, over 70 people that we'll have in our public health rooms, uh, providing them the support so they can safely isolate and return back uh, to then uh, their place of, of residence. So that T3 strategy is integrated as, you, as noted and it's uh, vital uh, to our strategy here in the region. I'll turn to Dr. Wooten and talk about the positivity rate. Thank you. I've asked staff to bring up uh, two slides. The first is our triggers dashboard. Positivity rate is actually one of our triggers. Uh, it is uh, number 10, uh, trigger number 10, and we want that to be less than 8%. 
So you see that trigger number 10. We green there. The actual target, we want that to be less than 8%. If we go to the next slide that you showed first, uh, while we are maintaining uh, the, uh, that, and that uh, less than 8% over a 14-day uh, uh, period, a rolling 14-day period, uh, uh, we are at 6.3%. And then uh, overall, each day, we measure the total uh, number of positives over the total number of uh, tests uh, reported. And these are not duplicates. These are uniquely uh, 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 individual uh, first-time uh, positives. They're not uh, du uh, duplicated uh, uh, test results. So we aren't, as some people and uh, rumors are out there, that we might be increasing our total. So uh, these are all uh, confirmed cases uh, based on the definitions that I shared with you on Monday. Does that answer your question? And Dr. Wooten, mm -hmm. yes, just to follow up there, um, when it comes to, though, the amount of tests we're getting right now, if we're fearing that the number of tests that we administer will be decreasing because of all of the, you know, reasons that Dr. McDonald mm -hmm. explained, do mm -hmm. we see this affecting the positivity rate in the future uh, with those limited number of tests? And then I have one more question after that. Unless there is a, a, a greater burden on the supplies, uh, but based on what we know right now, uh, while our overall testing might decrease uh, somewhat, uh, we are still, we'll still be able to maintain those targets or goals that have already been set by the state. Uh, again, in stage two, um, uh, 1.5 tests per 1,000, and in stage three, two tests per 1,000, and two tests per 1,000 is 6,000 and 600 uh, tests. So uh, we are confident that we can at, at least maintain that. Uh, but things may change in the future, so uh, we could have a dis different answer for you in a month or two months, depending on what things look like at that time. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. And Dr. Wooten, final question. If you could just step us through the evidence for those business owners that are having to shut down today, the bars, the restaurants, what evidence is guiding uh, the decision to say that a person is more likely to get COVID or spread COVID in a restaurant or a gym versus maybe somewhere like at home where it's being passed to family members. Um, if you could just step through that. Well, all of the settings that you've just named, we have outbreaks uh, where those uh, uh, cases have been identified. Outbreaks are when we have a large number, uh, actually three people from different households uh, associated with uh, uh, a particular location. But we know that there are people all over the county associated with numerous different types of settings. Uh, it might be one or two uh, people that are positive. So the point of the matter, the cases that we report every day, today we had 559 cases. The outbreaks that we've been uh, sharing with you uh, over the past, uh, actually uh, throughout the uh, pandemic, that's the evidence, the increased hospitalizations. Uh, I didn't cover deaths overall today, but increased deaths. All of the information that we are sharing with you is the evidence of the need to dimmer back uh, so that we can uh, put things in perspective so we can again try to uh, reopen again um, so that people can get back to their normal lives. But as was stated before and in the last slide of my presentation, if people adhere to those strategies, we can get back faster. And there's the uh, slide there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wooten. Okay, we have our last uh, call-in question. Paul Sisson from the San Diego Union Tribune. Please state your question. Thanks for taking my call. Can we get an update on the Helix collaboration? How many test results have been returned to date? Okay, uh, Nick Maschion is going to come up and respond. Paul, thanks for that question. Um, we're, uh, I think today was about a little under than about 1,000 uh, we've collected thus far. Uh, just wanted to point out with Helix, it is 2,000 a day. We're ramping up to that 2,000 a day. Uh, so it's not just a, a immediate. They're, they have the supplies uh, that we have about, uh, they gave us about 7,500. 
uh, samples, 10,000 also have been ordered that we'll be receiving uh, within the day. And so um, I'll have better numbers, uh, again, a little bit further down, and happy to provide those. Thank you. I had a question about contact tracing, which we saw in today's report hit what looks like a new low at 46% of new cases investigated within the 24-hour standard. Uh, we know that you guys would like that to be at least 70% of new cases investigated within 24 hours. Um, you know, this, this result comes after several days of this percentage improving. It looked like you were going to get back to 70 soon. Now it's suddenly gone in the opposite direction. Uh, what, is, what is causing that reversal of trend there? Yeah, I'll take part of it and then also give it to Dr. Wooten. Um, so the goal, obviously, is to be well into the 90s. Uh, I think the threshold is 70% for the state, well into the 90s for us. Um, when you look at the response beyond the 24th hour, so if it's the 25th hour, uh, it, it, it doesn't meet uh, that goal. So when we're looking at within 48 hours, it's in the 80 percentile uh, range. Uh, obviously, we got to get into that 24-hour period. So what Dr. Wooten was talking about of the onboarding of staffing, uh, we're also upgrading some of the contact tracers that have the skill sets uh, to be cross-trained to do that disease investigation. So there's tremendous amount of work. It is, though, because of the spike in cases. Um, and so, again, as the spike has come in, we're trying to ramp up uh, to that effort of disease investigators. But I'll turn to Dr. Wooten to add some more. Nick answered, the, answered the, the question there. Because of the increased numbers of cases, we had 559 new cases today. We're really above 500 pretty much for most days. Um, so it's the number of cases, Paul. It's plain and simple. There's no other answer. And it's just difficult for staff to keep up. So we are bringing on more staff. And as you may or may not have heard earlier, uh, we put out a job announcement today for uh, case investigators and uh, got 300 applications after three hours of that announcement uh, being public. So we are uh, bringing on more staff. Uh, since our numbers start to uh, tank, we did uh, adjust, do those things that uh, uh, Nick Machion stated, and uh, we share with you our mitigation plan. But again, the numbers, are not declining, they are continuing to increase. So that's what is contributing to that particular metric. Dr. Wooten, this Thank first you, Dr. Wooten. Oh, you're uh, welcome, I Paul. noticed uh, that there was a local lab in the list of community outbreaks today. Can you tell us any more about that? Uh, was that a COVID testing lab or some other sort of lab? We have a lot of different types of labs here in San Diego. Dr. McDonald will speak to that. Uh, sure. It is uh, one of the uh, local labs here in uh, uh, San Diego. Uh, I actually do know that that lab does do some uh, COVID testing, but uh, like many uh, venues, uh, we don't think it is the workplace that's the issue. It's actually um, uh, workers who are uh, at uh, that workplace and are um, um, uh, interacting with each other uh, outside the actual bench areas. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that we've seen in some of our um, uh, healthcare workers uh, in the past. Uh, it's more likely that they uh, expose each other when they're uh, not in the actual specific um, work environment. It's actually when they're in a break area or they socialize together, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, I hope that answer, answers that question. And I also just wanted to say that, again, we um, our, our metric on, on tracing is always to get within 24 hours, but uh, the good news is, is that within 48 hours, we're doing uh, much, much better, uh, 75, 80 percent uh, 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 success in reaching individuals. Uh, we, I'll be honest, we've set some pretty tough standards on ourselves uh, to be able to get out uh, these contacts as quickly as possible. Uh, I think if you look at uh, and compare us to other health departments, I think we do very well. There are some health departments that aren't able to contact trace at all, um, and uh, it's really unfortunate. So I, I really am grateful for the uh, staffing support that the county has given our team to be able to expand it to the uh, nearly 500 people that are on our roster at this time, and it's going to be expanded further because we do recognize that this is important, and uh, we do want to meet our own self-imposed tough metric. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. 
Uh, Paul, I was wanted to make one additional uh, comment in terms of uh, the metric for case investigations. We what we want to see is 90% or higher, both for case investigation and contact. The triggers are um, metrics that have been developed uh, so that if there is if there are issues that are going on that we need to, that, that would help support our taking action. Um, for changing our health office's order. So they're similar categories or criteria, but different metrics based on the uh, action that we want to take. Does that make sense? Thank you, Dr. Wooten. All right, thank you. Yes. And Dr. Wooten, this first text question is from Misha De Bono with Fox 5. For uh, gyms and other businesses, um, if they do decide to defy the orders from the governor, um, and stay open, what are the repercussions? So uh, I, just in general, we are uh, want to maintain compliance with the governor's order. And if there is non-compliance, then that will be referred to law enforcement and our uh, compliance uh, team to investigate. Okay, this next mm -hmm. question is from Cassie Carlyle with Channel 10. Some businesses have taken up lawyers who say the health department filed the orders to shut down businesses. If they have no health violations and are following the current guidelines, they say they should be able to remain open. How can they be asked to close if they are in compliance? Again, we are following the state's guidance. And uh, while individuals might uh, feel that they are following uh, the guidance and have no um, uh, issues, it is about the community. So in order to decrease the number of cases, the governor has um, set out these restrictions and we will continue to uh, comply with that. Okay, this next question is from Heather with Univision San Diego um, in, in regards to outdoor malls. Um, indoor malls have to close, but what about the outdoor malls like Fashion Valley, UTC, and Las Americas? Yes, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to clarify that. Uh, on Monday, we talked about how uh, with indoor malls, if a business is inside, uh, they can continue business uh, by having curbside uh, operations. For uh, businesses that open up to the outside, they can continue as far as we understand uh, and the interpretation of our county council that th those businesses can continue to operate. But again, operating uh, by maintaining the strategies that are recommended, social distancing, wearing of face coverings, and um, hand hygiene and sanitation. Dr. Wooten, this next question is from Carlos Gonzalez uh, with Univision. Just to clarify, um, sorry, um, inspectors are tasked with, um, what are they tasked with now that restaurants, gyms, and nail salons are closed, and how many inspectors are there? Well, in terms of numbers, what we uh, have, we have a, a, a compliance uh, program that is being developed, as I shared with everyone on Monday. And uh, so right now, uh, the lead for that uh, program uh, is formalizing the uh, process, the protocols. We're in the process of doing that. But while we're doing that, we're also working in collaboration with the state's uh, strike teams that are going out to various uh, businesses, and we understand that that will uh, not be in operation for uh, probably for a, another couple of weeks, but we will still be working in collaboration with the state and uh, then um, expand and develop uh, our own local compliance uh, program. So I can't tell you how many staff, but it is uh, com uh, comprised of staff from various departments. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. This next question deals with testing. We're going to ask uh, Nick Mascion to come up and respond. Okay, and that question is, um, we see the number of tests fluctuate from day to day according to the charts you keep showing. Do the numbers change in accordance to test capacity or number of people who get tested? And this is Nelly Cervantes with El Imparcial. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so you'll see peaks and valleys if you even go back uh, the chart we had, um, and and but some consistency uh, in the last three weeks, uh, getting in the seven thousand range, uh, if you will. Um, there's a number of factors, right? Uh, weekends we'll see a dip uh, and folks coming in, and we've now been testing for long enough in the various sites that. Um, 
uh, and there's another chart, uh, not the positive one prior to this, if we could show that. And, and knowing the different sites, th thank you, um, knowing the different sites, uh, we know what the need is. Uh, so for the county testing sites. For the state testing sites, uh, they have a certain uh, capacity uh, that they provide. Um, and so they try to max out those sites. And then there's other factors that play into where you might see peaks and valleys. Um, when we have uh, our hospitals, for example, that are doing elective procedures, uh, depending on uh, which hospitals or what timing they'll do procedures, you may see increased number of testing. Um, we saw, for instance, uh, we opened up our, our first site at Mira Vista uh, High School in Imperial Beach on Monday. And because of the uh, naval ship uh, and the air quality, uh, a little bit di more difficult, right? So we saw lower numbers. So there's a lot of environmental and other factors that go in play uh, for this. But we're seeing this steady state. I will point out, uh, because of our drop-in site at the County Tubman Chavez Community Center on Euclid, um, we uh, honor all those appointments. Uh, this is a drop-in, so the people that show up, uh, there's no appointments. But we'll honor all those tests. And so uh, you have to get there by 4.30, and then uh, how many we do. And so we'll see sometimes on 550, sometimes 500. So it, it's, uh, again, a number of factors that we're seeing. We track the data very carefully uh, to tell us how many tests and where, and that's what guides our decision on our testing sites. Director Michonne, there's another question about testing from Mimi Alcala with 10 News. With the current testing supply shortage nationwide and locally, could this mean potential reopenings would be delayed even longer? So I think this was uh, an earlier kind of related question, uh, and that is uh, for us in testing, from when we embarked on testing to where it is today, we're testing for the people who need the test. And so that priority group uh, is what we're going after. Our mission is to hunt the virus, uh, to get to those people uh, that need to be tested. So if they determine to be positive with the work of, our, of their physician, again, tied to a medical home, but also the great work of our epi team, is to make sure that they can selfly self-isolate so they're not spreading the virus. And so that level of our effort, the T3 strategy, uh, that is what we're continuing to do. Uh, that has really no relation to uh, uh, the reopening. Uh, I think it gets back to what Dr. Eisman, Eastman has said, Eisman said, and everything you've been hearing, and that our best approach is really the facial coverings, the physical distancing, the, the good hygiene uh, that is far better than any test and ensuring that we can reduce the number uh, and the community spread of the virus. Thank you. Uh, we have one final question uh, that was texted in, and this deals with the governor's order. Do you want to go ahead and ask it? And this one is from Mike McKinnon with KOSI. <clears throat> Are you able to overrule the governor's order and allow local businesses who have complied with this order to reopen under the county public health order? Yeah, and I'll respond to that. Uh, the governor's order is the governor's order. We do not have the ability to be less restrictive than the governor. Uh, we certainly could be more restrictive, but I think at this point, given our numbers, we're working very closely with our public health professionals, Dr. Wooten and her team, and uh, uh, we will certainly comply with the governor's orders, and if we saw a need to become more restrictive, uh, we would, but at this point, uh, I, I think uh, we're confident with what the governor has, has laid out, and we will um, work to uh, enforce his order. So that completes our uh, comments for today. Um, before we go, I guess this is, uh, you know, another uh, bad news situation because today is tax day. Uh, and uh, if, you're, if you haven't paid your, your uh, appropriate income taxes or the estimated taxes for due in, in uh, April or, or June, today is the day you're supposed to do that. Uh, I know we got enough things to worry about, but I just thought I would get that out there. But I do have some good news. You may recall that in May, uh, we worked with the state to launch the Great Plates program. This program offers three meals a day to qualified seniors who are more vulnerable and must avoid leaving home. These meals are provided by local restaurants who are paid for the meals, thus providing them some economic aid during these tough times. Well, we are happy to learn recently that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Authority, has extended the Great Lakes program to August 9th. 
This is the second time the program has been extended, and we're happy to see that. As of today, the program is serving nearly 1,900 individuals and has participation from more than 30 different local restaurants. Through July 10th, 229,672 meals were served as a part of the Great Plates Delivery Program. If you or a loved one are interested in this program, you can call the county's Aging and Independent Services Call Center at 800-339-4661. That's 800-339-4661. And select option number 7, or you can just call 211. Again, we want to thank uh, Dr. Eisman for being with us here today uh, to talk uh, from Scripps Hospital, to talk a little bit about uh, the consequences of younger people coming down with COVID and the long-term impact that it can have on their lives. Uh, we are not scheduled to hold briefings uh, tomorrow or Friday, but our communications office will send out updates as necessary. We will return Monday for our next briefing. Until then, Stay updated through our coronavirus website, coronavirus-sd.com. Until Monday at 2.30, again, stay healthy, San Diego.